Hello, this is Falterfire, and today's video is a review of all of the new items in version 6014. Uh, so, we got 27 total new items, 26 of which are in the general card pool, and one of which is an item that you will be rewarded with if you manage to defeat the very difficult uh, secret encounter in Area 3. It's not a huge secret. Uh, basically, there is an event. If you choose the right option in the event, and it's pretty straightforward, uh, then you will encounter uh, the new surprise friend who is incredibly difficult and a result of one day wanting uh, us beta users to stop uh, curb stomping Dragonfly Rider. And if you do beat that, you will get a, an item that you cannot get anywhere else. I will show that item at the end of the video. Um, if you care about discovering such things for yourself, I will... Uh, mention it again before I show it so you don't have to worry about being surprised by that. Basically, it will be after I pull up this new items review screen again at the end. So, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started with the new items, starting with the outfits. So, I mostly have one item per slide, but these three items, it felt right to put them on the same slide, put them together, talk about them together, because these three items are basically the same, just different elemental flavors. So these are the arcane robes, which is permanent arcane rune barrier, sorry, permanent arcane rune rank plus one, permanent arcane barrier rank plus one, max shield minus two. And then frost robes is the same thing, but you have frost rune instead of arcane rune, and frost barrier instead of arcane barrier, and shock robes is the same, but with uh, shock instead of arcane or frost. And so these items, the first note is, if you aren't familiar with how the permanent ranks work, what that means is, you will not lose that at end of turn, and if it is dispelled because you are, you take an arcane detonation, you will get back that rank after a turn. So you functionally have, when you have any of these items, you'll have the appropriate rune or barrier for the entire fight, for every fight, uh, which is very good. It really doesn't matter whether you're an aggressive deck or a defensive deck. These are still going to be fairly useful to either one. These won't necessarily be the best item available to you, you may be better off with like Aether Mantle, which is the uh, plus three status applied by items, or you may be better off with Adept Grove, which is plus 30% spell damage. If you are doing a bunch of single hit spell damage, you're playing like uh, Growth Rowden, and you're planning to cast like Singularity or Mind Blast for a bunch, then getting the plus 30% is probably more valuable. But other than that, even if you're a defensive deck, the barriers are nice. They reduce the incoming status by two, and you'll sometimes get those just bonus procs. And the uh, ability to have guaranteed sources of arcane, frost, or shock can be very, very valuable. Now, as far as power level goes, I would generally say that the frost robes are the strongest of them because freezing is just very, very good. And being able to get out of strategic freeze on various enemies, uh, especially because if you're an aggressive deck that is not quite a turn one deck, this the frost robes can allow you to buy an extra turn. Uh, where you can pretty easily get that first set of freeze up, that first freeze up, and so buy yourself the second turn for free, where just all enemies are just frozen on turn one a lot of the time. Uh, arcane robes are very valuable for both the extra damage they get out and also just being able to dispel uh, enemy buffs can be very, very useful, especially with a lot of enemies stacking like powerful or uh, dealing with the plated on like uh, Shadowbone Protector. So. Those are both very good. Shock robes are also powerful. They offer a lot of potential value, but they require you to plan around them more, and I'm bad at planning, which makes it worse for me. Um, the other thing to note is because these do just give the rune, if you've seen the Frost Dagger in the past, Frost Dagger adds plus two Frost to whenever you play a to each of your strike hits, and that stacks with Frost Rune because it's a separate effect. These are just using the regular buff, and they also mean that, for example, if you have uh, Arcane Strike, you probably will want to remove Arcane Strike if you pick up Arcane Robes, because the, the extra ranks of Arcane Rune from Arcane Strike will do pretty close to nothing for you. Uh, so I would generally not care too much about things that give stacks of Rune if I have the appropriate robes. So these are all very good. Like I said, Frost is the best. Arcane robes second best. Shark robes are third best, but this does depend somewhat on your deck. If you are doing a heavy spell damage deck, 
or like a heavy single card damage jacket, then shock ropes could be more valuable to you. Uh, although you may also struggle to get that active, but the shock barrier may be helpful. Basically, the only time that I would really con not consider any of these is if I'm on like uh, specifically Murley, no damage Murley, like a poison Murley build. Uh, because otherwise, even if it doesn't matter if you're getting hit or if you're doing the hitting, they'll, they'll, they'll do something useful for you. Other items, overflowing armor. So this is the, the fourth of the new outfits. And there are only four new outfits total. So this is max shield plus three, shield gains by cards plus three, and starting enemy shield plus 15. So this is interesting. The The starting enemy shield is, is not a huge downside. Uh, it can be useful if you happen to be playing any of the cards that care about, if you play like absorb armor or you take pilfering shield in area three. So you care about enemies having shield and you actually benefit from them having shield. But... If you aren't doing that, uh, this requires you to be very defensive. There are other armors. You won't only be offered every armor every time, but there are other armors that will just give you plus two shield gained by cards and won't give the enemies 15 shield. Um, like I said, that 15 shield, early on, that could be a big deal. Like If you see this like area one, that could be really frustrating. But in area three, the difference between an enemy having 180 and 195 shield, uh, 180 health and 180 health and 15 shield is pretty negligible. And especially in, in most of the toughest fights of the game, like Bayolator or... Uh, Bayolator's not actually that hard a lot of the time, but like Hollow Maw can cause people problems. And like against Hollow Maw, overflowing armor doesn't matter a ton because they're between, again, 1200 and 1215. Very minimal. That said, this doesn't really offer any offensive benefit, so I'm never going to be a huge fan of it. Um, still... Not bad, especially if you're the sort of person who runs a mana shield. This is very, very good with mana shield. Once mana shield is getting you five shield, it's suddenly a, a very good card. And if mana shield plus is giving you ten shield, uh, now we're in business. So yeah, this one's fine. Not amazing. Not the worst. So new weapons. Benevolent Mace. So this is strike damage plus three, purity applied by strikes plus one. This weapon messes people up a lot because it you, you read it and you think, oh man, so I play a strike and I get purity? That's amazing. No. There's a reason it does plus three damage, which is a pretty big bonus. And that is because it applies purity. So you know how, like, Blazing Blade applies burn on strike? Benevolent Mace works exactly the same way, which is to say the enemy gets the purity. A lot of people are, because this is a new item on the patch that is releasing with Sheru, who's a character who plays a lot of strikes uh, that apply debuffs, a lot of people are finding this out the really, really hard way. So uh, I'm not sure what decks really want this. I think there's probably a multi-hit Murley deck that may want this, although Envenom being stronger now makes that a little bit less true because I think that I'm more likely to be running Envenom if I'm running in Venom, I am less like or Virulent Strike, which gives in Venom, which makes me less likely to want uh, to be applying purity. But still, I could see that being useful. Most of the time, though, I think this weapon is a trap. I don't think it's bad, but I think that you would need a very... I would need to think long and hard before taking this. That's what I would say. This one, though, Berserker Axe. Strike damage, plus three. Damage taken by attacks, plus one. Now we're in business. Because... Uh, this is all offense, baby, um, and defense is for cowards. More importantly, that plus one damage taken by attacks, it can matter, but you, I'm usually not playing on such a thin margin that, that plus one makes a huge difference. This is not the first item we've had that, that is plus one damage taken by attacks, and I'll be honest, I rarely really notice when I pick up the, the effects of the... Um, it's, it's a tabard. I don't remember the full name of the item, but there's a, an outfit that is like plus 20% crit chance. You start with six growth and you take an extra damage from attacks. And I basically never notice the extra damage from attacks when I've got that. Sometimes, but this is normally going to be fine. And if you, I wouldn't take this if I don't have strikes, but if I have like any strikes, if I have even two to three strikes on my deck, I'll probably take this because this is a lot of potential damage. Uh, and... Sharu in particular obviously gets a huge value out of this, as does Murley, because both of them, if you're evading the hits, it doesn't matter how, how much damage it was going to do. So yeah, very good. 
I would absolutely take this in any build that's running strikes. Grimoire of Wisdom. Uh, so this is max mana plus two, max hand size plus two. I have yet to actually end up with this because I keep doing, uh, I haven't played that many runs on the new patch that weren't Sheru. And even though Sheru really wants max hand size, uh, there are a lot of other weapons uh, that are even better on Sheru. Anything that will help with strikes, just stuff like Frost Dagger or uh, Serrated Cleaver is amazing. And so I end up not actually, I, I end up with other weapons that are even better. But Grimoire of Wisdom, the max hand size is very nice. This does not increase how many cards you draw each turn. But this means that you can hold 12 cards in your hand before you start overflowing. And if you have watched me play, you know that there are quite a few runs where uh, I struggle to count to 10. And this means I, only, I, I can miscount 10 by up to 2 and still be fine. Right, Shield. I think this is one of the, the weapons I suggested, actually. But So the way this works is if you fully block an attack, you get a rank of Temporary Powerful. And you also get Max Shield plus 2. So what this means is basically, if you're playing a defensive deck, or especially if you're playing something like Goading Paladin, uh, this is very good. Uh, you get hit, and then you hit back. It's that simple. Overall, this is not a particularly high tier weapon. I think that even in the decks where it, it is very, it is at its best, it's usually not going to be better than like mid tier. You're rarely going to get more than you know two or three temporary powerful, and so uh, that's usually going to be comparable to having a weapon that's just like plus one or plus two strike damage or plus one strike damage and, and a and apply a debuff. So this isn't something I would usually be ecstatic about, but it can do some work and it's it's interesting and different and kind of cool. And I like it. Um, moving on. Sanguine Grimoire. So this is spell damage plus 20%, bleed applied by spells plus one, max hand size minus two. So... Counting to 10 is hard, like being able to do that. I don't want to deal with counting to 8. This seems very good for Drofus, although Drofus is particularly affected by the smaller max hand size because she has a tendency to fill her hand with blood bursts. But getting bleed played by spells plus 1 is also incredible, so you win some, you lose some. Hopefully you uh, win the one where you take this, or else you probably shouldn't have taken it. Um, obviously, if you aren't playing a decent amount of spells this is very bad um, max hand size minus two is a pretty big penalty uh, so you would need to be playing a pretty good amount of spells uh, salon also maybe could use this because of uh, cannon blasts although the awkward thing with cannon blast is that you inherently kind of want to play them later in a turn because you want to play other things first and bleed once you'd be playing thing you want to get bleed on the enemy as soon as possible uh, so that's kind of an interesting tension so I, this is another one where I haven't actually used, have and actually seen it in a deck where I wanted to take it. Uh, partially because, again, I've been playing a lot of Sheru, and although Sheru loves bleed, Sheru doesn't play a ton of spells and hates having a smaller max hand size. So that's where we're at. Scatterblast Wand. So this is plus 10% spell damage, and then singles target spells fixed area damage plus 20%. So I haven't played with this. I'm not totally certain how it works. I believe what it means is that if you have a spell that does 10 damage to all enemies by default, it will deal two damage to all enemies when you play it. I do not know how that interacts with buffs or debuffs. Uh, it, it does say fixed area, it does say fixed damage, so I assume it does interact with debuffs, but I don't know if it takes uh, your buffs into consideration when determining how much of the spell damage to convert so like if you had, uh, say, plus 100% damage from, I don't know, Mighty and then a combination of other things, then I don't know if you would get, uh, if that 10 damage would be, would see that it was, that you were going to play it for 20 and then do uh, 20, and then do 20% of that. The other thing is because it's single target spells, I don't know if the way it works is that like, you know, I did 100 damage to the enemy with my singularity because I'm playing Merlin, it was a critical singularity. And then that means that 20% of a hundred is 20, or if it would say the base damage on that singularity was uh, 50, so it's gonna do 10 AOE damage. Regardless, the point is, it doesn't have a downside. It boosts spell damage, it gives you some AOE. I don't know how much, um, and that seems solid. Uh, I think that if you are playing a big spell damage deck, this is probably going to be one of your best options. The other thing is that because it is fixed damage, that does mean that um, it can't be evaded, 
So this could be helpful against Ruby Dragon if you're uh, not able to quite one-shot Ruby Dragon. If you can hit Ruby Dragon with uh, a couple of really big spells, that could kill the Drakes uh, without needing to chip through the evasion. So that's potentially useful. So that is Scatterblast Wand. Moving on. Wand of Control. Wand of Control, damage dealt instead of supplied by allies, plus two. This is a very straightforward thing. Uh, if you're playing the summon deck, this is decent. Uh, possibly great, Poss possibly good. I don't think it will ever quite tip over into great. Um, you would, especially for Paladin, because the Paladin is usually using the turrets they're only going to hit once per turn until you've used... I am suppose you have... Anyway, this was a rallying command. It could, it could make up some more. But the point being, it is reasonable with um, any summoning deck. And summoning decks, if you're all in on summoning, you probably don't have other strikes or spells, really. So any weapons that benefit those won't do much for you. So this is a weapon you'll usually pick up if you're in a summoning deck just because the other weapons aren't helping, and this does. Uh, and that's fine. I don't think this is busted, uh, but it could get better if we get more allies we can use. Uh, right now, we just have a relatively small number of allies, uh, and they the, the most times they hit per turn is two, uh, not counting stuff like Frenzy or Rallying Command. So anyway. It's a decent bond of control. Seems okay. Uh, I, I again haven't seen it in the deck that I was that it works with. So new accessories. Calling caller. So now we're on to accessories. Uh, these there are a couple here that are really bad. This one though I like a lot. It is calling caller. It starting angry shield ally plus one. Sorry, starting angry spirit ally. Words are difficult. Plus one max shield minus two. So if you have calling caller. Then at the start of each fight, you immediately get an angry spirit in your first summon slot. This is quite good because this means that just 3x2 damage to the front enemy every turn unless or until the spirit dies. So it's just some bonus damage that you at a very low cost to you. There are some caveats. If you're relying on shock, this becomes worse because the angry spirit will consume the shock. If you are playing a paladin summon deck, this could be bad because you Oh, or if you're playing any summon deck, this could be bad. But Paladin summon decks especially may want to have a turret in that spot uh, in case, because against uh, single, against fights where you can't summon multiple, where you don't have enough space to summon another ally, you really want to be able to get one of those deploy turrets uh, frenzied so that it can quickly mow through enemies. And you do not want to be stacking a bunch of frenzy on an angry spirit ally because if you're not playing... Uh, thriving Spirit and Spirit Swarm, you probably don't have ways to buff that Spirit, and just doing 3x2 damage four times is not that good. So, it is ironically better if you aren't playing a summon deck a lot of the time. So keep that in mind. But it's pretty good if you're not playing a summon deck. It is still a pretty mid-tier thing. I would take it over something like a, a burn accessory that I'm not in burn, or something where it's like the only benefit I'm getting out of this is like plus two max shield. But I wouldn't take it over a, a particularly high value accessory like uh, spike shoulder pads. Obviously, in Shrew is, is the first example that comes to mind because that's the game breaking one right now. But I wouldn't even take it over um, something like life giving, not life giving, what's the name of it? A druidic cloak. This just plus one mana per turn. I'd probably take plus one mana per turn over this. So, Life-Giving Cloak. This is another new one. Ally Health, plus 20%. I think this one's bad. I think even in a summoning deck, you're going to struggle to get real value out of this. Um, there will be times when it, when it saves your allies from death, but a lot of times, the AoE damp when you're dealing with your summons getting killed, the margin by which they are dying is large enough that 20% health won't save them, I think. But this isn't the worst thing ever. It's... I guess it, it is better than nothing in the ally deck. Uh, it, it is nothing if you aren't summoning, though. So pretty low tier. I wouldn't quite put this in, in F tier, but it's definitely in uh, C tier, where it is fine but not really good or exciting in the deck that wants it, and it does nothing in the decks that don't. Rallying Tabard. This is in F tier, I think. So this is shield gains given to allies plus 20%. So you have to be in the ally deck, and you have to have cards that give shield, and then it is only giving 
for most of these, those shield cards, like two extra shield to your allies, which is rarely going to be enough to make the difference between your allies surviving or not on AoE attacks, I think. You know, maybe you buy one more turn. Maybe. It just seems incredibly... seems like a very small bonus for such a very narrow effect that it's just hard to imagine this ever really performing for you. Um, I guess F tier isn't entirely fair. You know, it's not actively detrimental. Um, it is, in some decks, it technically provides some benefit, however marginal. Um, and there are no, you will never take Rallying Tabard and then like your run is dead because it was a trap and you have, you, you have, uh, it has backfired and slain you. Whereas like Benevolent Idol, it, or not Benevolent, Benevolent Mace, the, the, the weapon that applies purity would absolutely fall into that category where you can take that and then whoops, there goes your run. You goofed. Uh, so it's better than that, but not very good. Serene Belt, damage taken with no shield, minus 25%. So I believe that the way this works is you have to have no shield when you get hit. So this is a complete non, uh, non-bow non with shield bot. But outside of that very specific instance, it can be pretty good for Drophus. A few other characters too. This is one of those cards, one of those items that you pick up. And even if your character, as, as long as you don't have shield bot, there will be fights that potentially could go poor. Basically, if Stream Belt never does anything for you, then the you are winning the run, if that makes sense. I would always take, if I have an empty accessory slot, I will always take Stream Belt over a discard because even if I don't plan to ever get hit, if I do get hit, taking 25% less damage, very, very nice. And that said, uh, if you aren't playing Drophus, I would, or uh, if you're not playing, I think Shrew also has kind of a, a, a no shields build. If you're not playing one of those two, I would probably put it like B tier. You know, decent survivability, but it's got no offense and it's not necessarily, and, and your goal is to have it never do anything. So for that reason, I wouldn't put it higher than B tier, but it is a pretty good item to pick up, especially if you're you're having kind of a rough run, your defense is kind of struggling. Uh, this can help a lot to, to shore that up. Especially if you combine it with like tough and weak. It's worth noting uh, there is a cap. The, the damage reduction is soft capped. So if you have like tough and weak and this, that you don't get the full minus 85% damage taken. Uh, it would be, I, I don't know exactly how it curves, but probably be like 70 something percent, which is still amazing. Like you'll still take very, 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 very little damage, but you won't take 15% uh, of the original damage. Venomous Cowl, poison damage, plus 20%. This is very straightforward. Are you on poison? Yes. Your poison is out 20% better. Are you not doing poison? This is useless. Uh, very straightforward. Very good. Say A tier in a poison deck. Useless everywhere else. Uh, I don't think there's much else to say about it. It's that simple. Oh, I do actually want to clarify real quick how it works. So it doesn't increase the amount of poison you apply. It just affects the amount of damage done by that poison. So if the enemy has 10 poison, if you have a Venomous Cowl, they will take 12 damage. Alluring Rune Heart. So now we're on to Trinkets. So Trinkets uh, trinkets are fun because a lot of these are going to be active Trinkets, and active Trinkets are often amazing. This one, for example, is active. Trigger the action of any enemy, and then you gain... Vengeance 8, Mighty 2, and Powerful 2. So, this is not temporary powerful. You get Powerful 2 for the rest of the fight, unless you get Arcane Detonated. It's not permanent. You, you can lose it. But most likely, you'll just have that Powerful 2 for the rest of the fight. Slight downside is you have to trigger the action of the enemy. So, this is something that I will usually take. It, in, in most fights, you will be able to find a window where you can activate this for value. Especially if you're playing, if you're playing a deck that can either freeze enemies or can summon ven uh, vengeful shades, this becomes even better. Uh, and the other note is, this is obviously a pretty aggressive item. The vengeance and the mighty are both 
even though you keep the powerful the vengeance and the mighty are going to be very short term so keep that in mind i it is i think very good in aggressive decks provided you have a way some way to manage whatever you're going to force the enemy to do um, the other note is this is one of those trunks that you may want to cut before the area three boss like it may be do a lot of work for you like area two and area three and then you're let you, you see that you're fighting uh maw and then you don't have any freeze and you don't have any way to summon shades and you're just like okay i'm replacing the luring rune heart with literally anything because i never want to use it against maw and that's fine cursed apple this is amazing it is active heal 10 create three shuffle shuffles so basically this is potentially costing you th uh, nine shield but it is a straight up, in all ways, a straight up draw three. Yes, it heals before you get the shrivels, which means that you uh, potentially are going to be down. If you don't have another way to heal, you could end the fight down on health. But the flip side of this is it will always give you the health you need to play for those shrivels. And even if you are fatigued, these shrivels will not be affected by fatigue because they're created in your hand. So this is a trinket that is very, very, very close to just being active draw three cards and any trinket that draws cards is very good this is amazing it's great you want it this is better than tiny book a lot of the time and tiny book is an a tier maybe s tier trinket um cursed apple's amazing you want it it draws cards um and and, and yes it's, it's a cursed apple but it curses it'll, it'll be fine don't worry about it energizer vial active get powerful five to any ally this is another one where it's it's a it's a summon item. If you have summons, it does things. If you don't have summons, it doesn't do anything. It is also another one where it is kind of a bit sketchy. Uh, it is probably better than the Wand of Control in terms of how much it does. Because plus five powerful to an ally is stronger than them just doing plus two damage. The flip side, of course, is that this will only affect one ally. And if that ally dies, you're just sad. And the other thing is, this is fighting against other trinkets, and you'll, you will see a lot of trinkets, and there are a lot of very, very good trinkets that this is going to have to fight against that will be relevant to your summon deck, whereas, like, Wand of Control is not fighting against other weapons for the most part because the summon deck doesn't otherwise care about weapons. So, Energizer Vial, I think it's fine. I'd put it probably B tier for the, the appropriate deck. It is, the earlier you get it, the better. Um, in, in area one, this is going to do a lot to speed up your kills for the summon deck. Uh, in later areas, it's going to do less just because you were already having to hit a, a decent amount of times. So I think this is going to be less valuable. But I haven't actually gotten a chance to try it, and it could be better than I think it is, especially with Angry Spirits. Uh, but obviously, it is pretty narrow because you do have to be on a deck that is summoning for this to do anything. Haunted Flask. Active. Draw three and gain three mana. Summon enemy... This one has a typo in this. I believe the typo has been fixed in the real version, but this is from beta. Summon one enemy vengeful shade. If you can't, lose 15 health. So, remember what I said about anything that draws is good. This draws and gives you mana, which are the two things you want most. Summoning vengeful shades can be a downside, and losing 15 health absolutely can be a downside. I would be more inclined to take this if I have any way to heal, and especially if I have any AoE. If you're a very defensive deck, this is going to be particularly bad because you, you may struggle to kill the shade. But in general, three cards and three mana, by the time you get to, to area three especially, that should be enough value to justify uh, dealing with a shade. But you pretty much just have to gauge based on your deck because that, that, is, that is the question that this flask is asking you, is can you get more value out of three cards and three mana than one health worth of shade in terms of what you can do. If the answer is yes, this is great. If the answer is no, this is not very good. That said, even if normally a shade is going to be relatively expensive for you to kill, seeing more cards can be such a huge lifesaver if you are trying to do a lot of work on turn one. Having that ability to just see more cards on turn one can be huge because uh, you've there's always that possibility, especially with the number of fights you're going to be doing in depth three, that you will start at some point a fight where your opening hand is just all duds. And if you don't have any other ways to draw cards, having a way to just help you start, give more chances at finding something relevant in case you get that opening hand that is all mana or that opening hand that is no mana and you can't 
quite get there. Incredibly good. And this does guarantee you some mana with a draw, which is also super, super valuable. Because uh, like Tiny Book can't do that for you. Tiny Book doesn't give you any mana. This does. So yeah, this is very good. Uh, obviously, losing 15 health can be a downside. Uh, especially if you're playing closer to the wire. So just be careful about that. On the other hand, if you know that Shades is going to be a problem and you know you have healing, uh, pop it while the board is full, which is going to be true in a lot of fights like Area 3 mid-boss or Area 1 boss or uh, any mo most post-mid-boss fights. A lot of post-mid-boss fights will be full fights. So that's one way that you can easily... The, the, it could be more useful to you there if you have a lot of healing. Oh, and it will trip Grofus' level 7 and do 8 damage AoE if you lose the health. So that's something. And you'll get a blood burst. Hunter's Horn, starting Predator rank, plus 4. I think this is pretty good. Uh, if you are an aggressive deck, this is often going to be better than the Mighty Rune because Predator is a buff that you are less likely to otherwise be generating on your own. And it's not too difficult to end up with, you know, two to three uh, debuffs on enemies, so you're getting 20 30% damage. Uh, this is not a trinket I would usually go out of my way for. I would not replace a, a card draw trinket with it. But this is great for just getting some extra damage in your aggressive deck. Um, and I absolutely think it is very worthwhile, absolutely worth picking up if you are in an aggressive deck. Rickety Hand Cannon. Active. Create two Cannon Blasts. So this is in that camp of trinkets where you activate it and you just kind of get some cards that do some damage. This is, it's kind of like a bag of tools, but the tools are always cannon blasts and there are only two of them. Um, and cannon blasts are not tools, they're spells. This is obviously stronger if you have spell synergy or if you have, the fact that this will just be like often an arcane detonation in a box is very good. You do have to remember that because these are cannon blasts, you want to activate it earlier in the turn so that you have you can play other cards to make them cheap and make the cannon blasts cheaper. But overall, I tend to to like this a decent amount. Having a button to break glass in case of emergency to get damage is nice. But this is probably not a, this is not really a top tier trinket. It is very kind of middling tier. I will happily take it if the other options aren't doing a ton for me, but it is absolutely getting pushed out of the way in favor of something like, uh, again, Tiny Book, Cursed Apple, um, Haunted Flask, any of those that draw cards or give mana or anything like Shield Bot that's just like a top tier defensive trinket. Those are absolutely getting the nod over, over the hand cannon. But still, it's fun and it's cool unless any character fire a cannon. And you gotta love firing cannons. Skeleton key, treasure cost minus one. This item is incredibly powerful in any deck that is generating treasures. Um, it is, it can be worth a lot of mana and it lets you upgrade treasure generating cards to make them incredible. Like uh, Demonic Greed Plus, it goes from being seven mana to draw eight cards on average to being three mana draw eight cards on average and that is nutty um that is that is unreasonably good value uh it is it is also very valuable if you're playing like sharu with with treasure map and so this is another way to just completely you just do even more to to bypass fatigue because you just discard your treasure map to your uh tricky focus and then you get these treasures that are free because they don't have fatigue because they're created cards. And then you just keep going. Skeleton Key is great. I love it. It is it's it is one of those trinkets where if you don't have treasures, it obviously does nothing. So you'll kind of know when you see it whether or not your deck is going to gonna get value out of it. And obviously, if you take it early speculating because you, like, you know your card pool has Demonic Greed or Royal Coffers, um, you could take it speculatively. And just if you th those cards don't turn up to to go with it, you just cut them later. You, you, just, you just replace this later with something else. But it's very very useful in a lot of uh, in a lot of decks, I think. And I think a, a lot of the treasure cards are pretty well positioned right now. Uh, Demonic Greed, I keep mentioning, is kind of the big one. I think Treasure Hunt is a good card in a lot of starting decks. Royal, Royal Coffers, I don't like as much. Uh, Secret Cash though is still good. So overall solid card or solid trinket I would absolutely use it a lot of the time and I've gotten a lot of value out of it 
in my own runs. Soulcatcher Ingot. Man gained on kill, plus two. This is very much a, a Sheru item, I think. You can use it on other characters. Um, but two mana on kill is going to be a fairly small bonus if you aren't bringing your own kills to the party, which by which I mean Vengeful Shades. I would usually only... I, I would take this over discarding it. Don't get me wrong. But I would only really actively take go after it if I was playing Sheru. It is a fun combo with Pirate Hook, though. Pirate Hook did get nerfed this patch. Pirate Hook is now only one treasure per kill. Um, but if you have Pirate Hook and Soulcatcher Ingot, and Soulcatcher Ingot will give you the mana to play the Pirate Hook after, every time you get a kill, and that's great. So yeah. It's probably C tier if you aren't summoning Vengeful Shades, and it's A tier if you are. Spirit Bane Wraps. Vengeful Spirit Self, minus 25%. I've tried this one. I think it's often hard to notice even when I am fighting Vengeful Shades, even when I am doing the Vengeful Shades thing. Um, and they're called Vengeful Shades. This is another beta typo. So, if you are something Vengeful Shades, this does make it a bit easier to kill them. Um, but, and especially if you're like playing Sheru and you want to line up like executes and such, um, then this is valuable. But, I would generally say that trinket slots are very competitive and I would be hard pressed to keep this for the whole run. I might pick it up, you know, I, I would take it up over discarding it if I have any vengeful spirit, any vengeful shade generation. Um, but if I don't, then obviously I'm not going to take it. And I wouldn't really even, I, I would even consider discarding it over speculating on it, even if I know that I have like forbidden rights in the pool. Because I just think it is very marginal value. I think that that minus 25% health is relatively unimportant as far as managing the shades goes. And I haven't really noticed when I've had it. So that could just be me not paying attention. Strong T. Cards drawn by exhaustion is plus one. So if you have this and you play an exhaustion, then you draw a card. That's pretty cool. But what is your deck doing that you're playing exhaustions? I, I'm not a believer in the exhaustion deck. I, I think that I think Strong T is good with Frenzied Rage specifically because Frenzied Rage is incredible. But outside of specifically Frenzied Rage to uh I, I, I think that if you are playing exhaustions, something has gone wrong in your game plan most of the time. Uh because if you're playing exhaustion generating cards, I think you generally want to be trying to win before you draw into your exhaustions. And the thing with this being an item is that you can't plan around finding it. So I wouldn't build a deck that is planning to play exhaust that, that is playing drawing towards exhaustions just because there's a chance of getting strong T. So I think this is pretty bad. I think that it I suppose, it's less accurate to say that I think it's bad. It's more accurate to say I think that this is an item where if it is useful, your deck is not doing well. Um so that's where I would stand on this one. Uh, the other note is this is still just going to be break even on your exhaustions. It is still not, it doesn't make your exhaustions good. It just means that they are less bad. So you're still paying a tax to get to get a card. It's like if uh, Shrivel said lose three mana instead of uh, lose three health. So that is all of the generic card pool items. Like I said, this is your warning to hop out if you are very spoiler sensitive, if you don't want to see the amazing Secret item dropped by the new friend surprise in Area 3. If you're still with me, I think that this has been a long enough pause to let anybody who wants to jump out, jump out. All right. So Paladin Core. The surprise boss is a is an evil Paladin unit. It's the corrupted Paladin unit specifically. And it has the Paladin Core. So this is, you get 8 energy and curse 2. So this means you can supercharge on any character, which means that you get six card plays worth of double damage or 60% uh, extra damage, 60% extra status, and minus one cost, which is a lot of fun. So the thing with Paladin Core is if you have Paladin Core, you beat the Corrupted Paladin unit, and that means that you are uh, you won the run, basically. It is the hardest fight in the game. It's not close. It is harder than Maw. It is harder than Bailator. It is, hard, it, it is just 
in every way going to be a fight that will, if you can beat that fight, you probably, for one thing, don't need me to tell you how to play this game. Um, that fight's not easy and beating it is a testament of skill. And you don't need me to tell you that this is whether or not you want this. You, you can make that evaluation call for yourself. Uh, but I like it. It's fun. Um, you get to supercharge with anybody. Everybody can go supercharge. What's not to love? Um, so yeah, that is, that is all of the new items. And that is it for this video. I know I still have quite a few videos that I have promised. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely working on them. They will come out. Uh, but I have been distracted by other things and I'm lazy. So <laughs> I, I still will, am making a new card video, a new and updated cards video, and at least one or two Sharu guides instead of just the run videos that I've uploaded. And those will be coming out eventually. So see you guys for those and whatever other videos I upload in the meantime. Until then, toodles.